All right, hello everyone. It is five o'clock on the last day of the conference. Uh, like, how are you guys doing? I'm, I'm kind of like fried at this. Yeah, I know, right? Punch drunk a little bit. So that, that's where I'm at. So uh, uh, I'm gonna make a deal with you guys. I haven't done a live presentation in like seven years. And if I just kind of like zone out up here, if you guys like give me a pass on that, then I'll pretend I don't see you sleeping in the audience. So like, are, are we good? Is, is, that, is that a deal? All right, awesome, awesome. Okay, good deal. All right, so uh, I'm Mark Nelson. I work on Ceph Performance. I've been working on Ceph for, I don't know, like 10 years or something. Um, now at Kleiso, but still doing the same thing. So uh, what I want to talk about today is sort of performance tuning, but it's really kind of about like Ceph performance in general. So um, I'm gonna start out with like a kind of a controversial slide. So like, is Ceph slow? I hear this a lot lately, uh, usually from competitors, right? If you ask them, we're slow. If you ask our sales guys, we're fast, right? If you ask me, well, it kind of depends sometimes. Um, so this is a quote from Neil Stevenson. He's one of my favorite authors, but I thought it was very appropriate. Um, performance with Ceph kind of depends on the particular situation that you're in. So um, how can we test it? That's basically the, 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 why, why I kind of came up with as the next slide that should be here. Um, we use a benchmarking tool called CBT Upstream. Um, there are a couple of different groups that are using it uh, for Crimson. Uh, I believe those guys are, are using it and, uh, and so am I for all my stuff. Um, it's, it's not bad. Um, it's a little bit, you know, it's kind of some ugly Python in places, but we can create a 60 OSD cluster in about 90 to 100 seconds and have it ready to run tests. Um, as opposed to uh, some other tools, it kind of tries to be agnostic regarding the benchmarking tools that you use. So uh, we can run FIO, we can run HSBench, we can actually still sort of run uh, a couple of different S3 tools. There's one that, I can't remember the name of it now actually, but not Cosbench, it was actually get, get put by uh, uh, the guy at HP that wrote it. Yeah, yeah. So we've got like plugins for a couple of different things. Cosbench actually is there too, theoretically. Um, Rados Bench, other stuff. Um, we do a lot of per test monitoring and uh, diagnostics. So running background uh, like data collection through Collectel. We can do block trace, Valgrind, a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, as I said, Crimson team's been using it for a while. Uh, Intel uses it. Uh, actually, there was a presentation earlier from the people that are doing uh, mclock and QS. They're using it for that as well. Um, it's not bad. Uh, worth checking out if you want to try to do a lot of performance testing. Maybe not super convenient if you just want to do like one-off stuff. All right, so um, I have a colleague at Kleiso that has actually been starting to write a dashboard, the kind of most uh, pressing feature that it needs is that right now it's really, really hard to look at the results. So he's writing this really slick dashboard to uh, make it so that you can look at test results in much more kind of fun ways. So uh, not done yet. This is just a prototype that he's working on, but it looks like it's going to be really, really good. All right. Other useful tools. Uh, FIO. I hope everyone knows what FIO is. Um, HS Bench is a S3 benchmark that I wrote. Um, it's very much kind of geared at getting a lot of like latency data and other stuff out of your system. Um, it's pretty fast, but it doesn't have some of the features that like MiniIO Warp does um, or Cosbench does. So um, a little bit of a different market, but it might be useful for you. Um, Collectel for system, system monitoring, perf, uh, CPU profiling. UWPMP is a wall clock profiler that I wrote that can use uh, libdw or libonline backends. Uh, so if you're interested in profiling OSDs, this can be really, really useful. I'll show some examples later. And then um, you know, eBPF, that's uh, very good for kernel and user land tracing. All right, so when I made this slide, I was kind of trying to think about when does Ceph perform its best? Like how can we talk about when it does well? 
And so I kind of came up with these four points. They're not necessarily always universal, but they are things that kind of are trends that I tend to see. So clients uh, have to be actually exercising the cluster sufficiently. Uh, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that today, but um, something you know, note. Uh, big thing is that work is spread evenly across the resources in your cluster. There's a lot of ways this can not happen, uh, but it's really important. Uh, and we'll talk about some examples there as well. Ceph isn't waiting on resource contention, also a really big deal. And then uh, we have a number of examples where we actually do some unnecessary repeated work. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So, okay, let's look at an example where Ceph is actually performing well. This is very recent testing that we were doing on Reef. We have a 60 NVMe cluster spread across 10 nodes. Um, in this case, there are 60 RBD images, 3x replication. This is a case that Ceph tends to do pretty well in. Uh, we can do about 4.5 million IAPs on this cluster, um, at least for reads. Uh, you can see on the, the right-hand side here, I think it's probably visible, uh, we're burning somewhere around eight cores per OSD to do this. So it's, you know, takes some CPU to do it, but, um, you know, we're seeing pretty even performance across multiple iterations. We're seeing pretty consistent CPU usage. Things look pretty good in this case. Um, before we did that, prior to getting that really nice result, I was doing a lot of testing on this cluster, and one of the first issues that we saw was that the underlying SSDs could actually get into a state during writes, not during reads like what we just saw, but during writes, we could get into the state where we were seeing uh, really high queue wait times on the devices, and specifically one device in the cluster. And that one SSD that was showing this, like these super high queue wait times was slowing everything down. Uh, I was able to make everything happy by upgrading the firmware. We happen to be able to get the, uh, a firmware update from this particular vendor, which is not an easy thing to do. But updating the firmware made the problem go away. It has since come back. It's, you know, I'm not sure why. I haven't figured it out yet. Next step is probably to do like a full secure wipe on the drives and just see how that goes. But um, what is a very, very well-performing cluster when the drives are behaving well drops maybe 30 or 40% when they're not. So, you know, Ceph is really sensitive to this kind of thing. It's really, really important to be able to go back and look at how are the devices behaving, how's the hardware behaving, are there weird software things on the cluster, uh, is Ceph doing everything he's supposed to be doing right? It's, it's a big deal. So, okay, let's look at one example on the software side where things really matter. In this case, it's the PG count. Uh, we are now at the point, this wasn't always the case, but we're now at the point where uh, having a sufficient number of PGs in the pool really, really matters at high levels of performance. Going from 4,096 PGs on this 60 uh, OSD cluster, uh, if you, at that level it was like 3.1 million IOPS, going up to 16,000 got us closer to like 4.5 million. So, you know, this is a big deal. Like, we, we need to be very conscious of this. Of our four different things that I kind of mentioned earlier, we have two of those cases really matter in, in this example that I gave. Uh, one is spreading work evenly across resources. The other is um, avoiding waiting on resource contention. So in that first case, making sure things are spread out across OSDs. I, I'm guessing most people have heard like, that having too low a PG count can kind of be bad for performance. The reasoning for that is because we end up in a situation where just because of how uh, PGs are distributed uh, across OSDs, you can end up with some OSDs being represented by um, like, being uneven, like, unevenly represented by PGs. And that happens much more frequently at low sample counts or low PG counts. Uh, it's very similar to Monte, Monte Carlo random sampling. There's a link here that's really, really kind of nice, a nice explanation of how that works. Um, I'm not gonna get into it too much here, but you know, go look at it if, if you're interested in this. So, okay, random distributions look clumpy at low sample counts, and higher PG counts 
result in more even workloads. We just kind of saw the results of that. Um, but does that fully explain this? Um, oh, actually, before I go on and say that, I did want to mention that Josh Solomon and Laura Flores are working on trying to improve this at low PG counts by uh, implementing a primary workload balancer, which hopefully will let us kind of improve the behavior at low PG counts. And the big point is that it does it without having to uh, change the topology of the cluster, which is really, really impactful. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually kind of hopeful that we're going to see a good improvement there. But it isn't the only reason why things are slow, like, or, or low PG counts aren't, sorry, that the distribution quality isn't the only reason why I think we're seeing slow performance at low PG counts. What we're also seeing is that when you're at low PG counts, there's lock contention in the OSD worker threads, specifically PG lock contention. So this is just a random sample out of uh, one of the threads on one of the OSDs. Sometimes it looks a little lower, sometimes it looks a little higher, um, but we're spending a significant time, amount of time waiting here. Um, I suspect that even when we use a primary uh, read balancer uh, at low PG counts, we might still see this showing up. We'll just have to see how it works when we actually, you know, are able to, to do more testing there. But, um, you know, this is still a real big concern for us. So are there other interesting cases like this? Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting is in CephFS, we've implemented this idea of ephemeral pinning, where you randomly pin certain subdirectories within a given directory so that it can distribute the work over multiple MBSs we see the same behavior there that we kind of see with PGs and OSDs. If you don't have enough directories to spread over all of your MDSs, you'll get hotspotting because it's a random distribution. So that is one example of this kind of behavior where we're not necessarily seeing good distribution. Um, in some tests that I had done for the IO500, we actually saw that like perfect round robin pinning was about twice as fast as ephemeral pinning. But ephemeral pinning is still a huge win over doing dynamic subtree partitioning if you've got like a lot of directories that you can spread across different MDSs and all of them are getting an equal amount of work. So uh, kind of an interesting case there. Um, we also see uh, other contention issues sometimes in the MDS specifically related to how e subtree maps are uh, basically being encoded and how they interact with uh, log segmenting. So there's a lot here to unpack and a lot here to do, but we tend to see some of these same kind of patterns over and over again. So I've got a couple of different cases I'm gonna try to go through pretty quickly. Um, let me check and see how much time I've got on this. Oh, I've still got time, okay. So I mentioned IO500. What we're looking at here are different kinds of tests that they run, easy tests and hard tests. Their easy tests are ones like what I had just described a little bit ago. We have lots of directories that we can spread over multiple MDSs. It's really nice, a really nice workload. It lets us see higher IOPS rates uh, where we can do ephemeral pinning or do round robin pinning. It, it works pretty well. And adding more MDSs, active active MDSs, usually makes these numbers go up. Um, I think if I remember right, these were run with maybe like 30 MDSs, I think. But those numbers improve fairly dramatically if you go up to like 60. The hard tests, though, are really nasty. That's where you've got like a lot of files in one directory. Or I think, uh, yeah, I think these are all, all metadata related. So lots and lots of files in one directory. You have new directory fragments being created constantly as more files are added. Uh, there's a lot of contention and a lot of latency where we're contending on certain locks in the MDS, it's not able to, uh, to export DIRFRAGs well. Uh, it's, you can see here that the, the, the rates that we got were, were quite a bit lower. And um, that's, these hard tests are probably the ones that are holding us back in that particular benchmark the most. So I was really, really excited. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Zhang had written a number of PRs uh, the, the two big ones I was really excited about are here, removing the subtree map from the journal 
and also randomly distributing dirt frags to multiple MDSs. Uh, unfortunately, both of those PRs are now closed. They were incredibly complex. Uh, and it's just, it was, it was kind of too much. Um, so those have now been closed. But uh, there are a couple of new ones. One is uh, written by Patrick, uh, where he's also trying to figure out how to reduce the amount of uh, subtree map updates that we have to do when journaling. And I'm, I'm really excited to get that PR in because I think that's going to make a big improvement. There was actually also a talk a couple hours ago where um, QoS is being added into uh, CephFS. And that also will probably improve our performance in the IO500 like significantly. And I mean, legitimately, it should help a lot for real clusters. So all of this is, is really, really exciting. Um, next case I wanted to talk about is RBD snap trimming. We have uh, this case that Paul Kuzner, I think, was the original one that was working on, where with RBD mirroring, we were seeing that the OSDs were using way more CPU than they should have been. Um, and eventually, through kind of a, a multi-person effort with Paul, Adam, me, uh, there may have been other people involved, I, I can't remember, uh, we, we basically figured out that when we were in this process of, of doing snap trimming, we were iterating over shared blobs over and over again because every single extent that was being created was basically resulting in a shared blob being created as well. And there was a lot of work just basically uh, uh, iterating over all of this metadata. So once we had figured that out, uh, Adam, I'm going to say we had a little competition. I don't know if it's really true, but we'll, we'll claim it was. Um, we both tried different fixes. I uh, wanted to see what would happen if we implemented defragmentation on clone. So the, the idea there is that we have already fragmented these objects really, really badly. We've got all kinds of shared blobs. What if we just basically took all that and wrote out a new object with one shared blob and one extent, and then proceeded on after doing that? Um, so that, that was like a, I don't know, maybe a 20 line fix. It's tiny, it's nothing. Um, the problem with that is that there's right amplification involved in space amplification because now you've severed your, your snapshots from the head object. So you've got extra data that's, that had been written that's, that's no longer associated with the head object and you've, you've done another write so you're, you're writing out more data to the drive. Adam's fix, however, is, is really fancy. He's changing a lot of the way that the data structures work so that we can reduce the number of shared blobs overall. And that's really exciting. Uh, doesn't have downsides that mine does. And it looks like from our testing, his solution works really well. So I don't know how well you can actually make this out. The blue line, or the blue, uh, you know, I guess line sort of, uh, is the default behavior that we saw in, I don't know, this, this is probably master. Uh, when we were doing this test, the, the OSD was pretty consistently spiking up to about 250% CPU usage. With Adam's old version of his PR, we dropped that down to around 200%. With my stuff, the defrag option, we could get that lower. We could get it down to like 150. And if you combined his old stuff and my stuff, that was the green line, which was even lower yet. And for a while, that's why I thought we were gonna end up having to do is basically a combination of the two approaches. Adam's new work that he's done on it got us down to that dark red line where we are like consistently using maybe about one core during this whole process. So it's like a, a pretty dramatic improvement. And um, if I remember right, I think we were seeing pretty good latency improvements as well. But uh, I haven't seen Paul's latest test that he's done. But uh, yeah, so exciting stuff. And all of this is basically because we reduced the amount of work that we were doing. We were able to make it so we didn't have to iterate all over all of that metadata that previously was there and found smarter ways to do it. So again, another thing where, you know, fits into this kind of these, these themes that we see. All right, next, case three, OSD threading. So um, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that if you have an OSD where you don't have a lot of CPU available to it, you're running on maybe like uh, one or two cores, we see that efficiency actually goes up 
fairly dramatically if you drop down to one worker thread, one messenger thread, and one shard. It's, it's pretty dramatic. I think it was like 40% or something. Um, so I started doing a lot of testing looking, okay, what happens at different shard counts and thread counts uh, and messenger thread counts? And this was really, really interesting behavior. This is on an NVMe drive, so it's, it's you know, a, a fast drive. And this is allowing as much CPU through to the OSD as, as it wants. And what we saw is that when we drop down to like a low number of shards, like two shards, and give it a lot of threads, like worker threads, that we hit this, this case where performance starts going down and going down dramatically. One of the things you're not seeing here is that if you bump this back up to two messenger threads, that really low performance that we see, that like 30,000 IOPS, it doubles. It goes back up. And we don't know why this is yet, but we think that there's probably some kind of unfortunate beha behavior with the way that threading is implemented in the classic OSD, um, probably related to how we sleep threads and wake threads up based on the queuing that happens per shard. Um, don't know for sure. Talked to Sam about it earlier today, or no, sorry, yesterday, and uh, and he thinks this is not a bad theory. So we'll see, but um, there's definitely something going on here that we can probably improve. Okay, case four: PG log RocksDB interaction. Uh, I don't know if you guys have looked at maybe the the Cephio blog. Uh, there's kind of a really uh, detailed blog article about there out there about RocksDB, but one of the things that, that we've seen in the past that some of this tuning seems to help with is we write out PG log entries to RocksDB for every single write. And they're short-lived, usually. Usually they go away. We want them to be propagated into RocksDB's write-ahead log to make sure that we can get them back if there's a, a failure or whatever but we don't really want these things to go into RocksDB and being compacted into the database. We're kind of abusing the write-ahead log sort of uh, to do this. So what happens is we want big buffers in RocksDB in the log so that we can keep these PG log entries there for a long time with the hope that when we actually flush a mem table, which is basically a buffer for the write-ahead log, it will see that the PG entry has been deleted. There will be a tombstone there, and you can say, oh, okay, I don't actually need to write this out to the database. I can just get rid of it, it's fine. Um, that's great, except that what we also see is that when you let mem tables grow to be very large, RocksDB has to spend a lot of CPU to keep it in order. These are implemented as skip, skip lists internally. So that adds CPU. And because all of our write-ahead log writes in Blue Store happen in a single thread, that's actually a point of contention. That's where we see bottlenecks during small random writes. So there's this, this contention where, on one hand, you want small mem tables because that lets you avoid CPU usage. But we also want big mem tables because we want PG log entries to be recycled before they're put into the write-ahead log. So we, we actually did some work tuning RocksDB, and it seems like we actually found better tunings for it. So that should be coming in Reef. Uh, it looks pretty good. One of the things I do, do want to mention, though, is that um, Igor, he couldn't be here today, unfortunately, um, but he has been working on an experimental write-ahead log prototype that's right in Blue Store itself that would allow us to disable RocksDB's write-ahead log. And, um, we ran through some, pro some tests of his prototype and saw that when we combined better RocksDB tuning with his log, we actually saw really, really good single OSD 4K random write performance, like 122,000 write apps, I think. You won't see that on a real cluster. You won't be able to get like 122,000 write apps per OSD on a real cluster. But it's looking like this is a pretty good improvement and if it improves latency as well, we could see a pretty dramatic improvement. Okay, finally, this is my favorite case that I wanted to bring up. Uh, so in this case, what we saw was that, this has been going on for I think like a couple of years. There's this case where when we are trying to delete 
things out of collections where there's a lot of KV entries, we have this pattern show up where we basically seek to some point in the database and then we start iterating till we find a key and we delete it. And we might delete something else, like another one after if you're doing like a bunch of deletions. Then we start to do a seek over again and we iterate again. Now we start iterating over the tombstones that we created for the deleted keys that we had just deleted and we get to some new keys and we delete those. We do it over again and again and again and again. And RocksDB doesn't do any kind of compaction on deletion. Compaction is how you get rid of tombstones. So because that happens, maybe you're lucky, maybe you've got some writes coming in at the same time that force a compaction. But if you don't, if you're just doing deletions, you end up, you can get into a situation where we're spending so much time iterating over tombstones that it actually causes heartbeat timeouts and your OSDs go down. We have people doing, having that happen. Um, yeah, right, it's a big deal. Um, so there's been a couple of different ways in the past that we've tried to fix this, some better than others. Uh, range deletion did not go well. We tried it, we had even worse problems at the time with it. This was like four years ago, maybe five years ago. Um, it's great if you've got tons and tons of keys that you want to delete, but if it's like 100 keys, you don't want to use this, or at least you, you didn't at that point. I've heard that they've maybe, maybe made it better, so we should look at it again, but um, at one point, it was, it was quite bad. Um, something that has worked well is uh, Corey Snyder and Igor, I believe, both implemented uh, a couple of different PRs to restrict the range for seeks. Uh, they, we just had like a really, really big range that we were, we were iterating over that was kind of unnecessary. So uh, that actually is really good. Um, finally, here on this slide, um, a couple of different people started playing around with uh, per SST time to live. That basically means that if an SST file in RocksDB hasn't been compacted for a certain amount of time, it, we force a compaction. Um, that actually did help for people like out in, in the field uh, for real clusters. But the problem is, is that it sometimes forces compactions when it's not necessary and they saw a huge write amplification and huge disk utilization growth because of it. So it, it helped them. They actually, they were some of the people that were having timeouts, that were having heartbeat timeouts. And basically uh, the trade-off was that it made their clusters like really, really heavily utilized. So the good news is that there's a PR, which I have to take credit for because I wrote it, but it's, I, in taking credit for it, like, this is a stupid PR. It's tiny. It's not, not like, it's, it's basically enabling a feature in RocksDB that we should have already known about. So it's, it's, it's not really a, a, an exciting thing exactly, other than the fact that the, the performance difference and the, the benefit from it appears to be incredible. So um, Alex from DigitalOcean tried this, and, and the, the only thing he sent back to me after he had tried it was, whoa. That was like the, 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 the single statement that he made. If you can see it, I don't know if it's very visible or not, but uh, that yellow line is insertion latency that they were seeing with Pacific before they, they tried doing this. And you can see it just basically kept going up to like 60,000 milliseconds. On their cluster, which I assume is pretty heavily loaded with stuff they're doing, after the patch was applied, it's flat. 10,000 milliseconds, which you know is a little, little rough, but um, I, think, I think they have a fairly heavily loaded HDD cluster. Um, I didn't, these aren't my pictures, so I'll, I can't claim credit for that. But, but yeah, try to look at the numbers on the axis because um, yeah, we're going from like 60,000 milliseconds down to about 10,000 milliseconds and it's flat. So, Really, really good, um, even if it doesn't look like it. Next graph hopefully shows it a little bit better though. So I, I just last night got uh, the okay from David to show this slide. Um, I don't know if any of you guys know David Orman, but they run a very large Ceph cluster in the cloud. And um, they were using the TTL setting uh, in RocksDB to kind of control that behavior that I was talking about. And before they were running with that patch, if you can see it, I know the, the, the font's really small there. Their disk utilization for all disks was hovering between 90 and 95%.
that kind of chaotic period in between is when they were doing uh, upgrades and uh, upgrading to a patch version of Ceph that they, they wanted to use, including this patch. Um, and there's a lot of up and down there. And um, they were able to verify that that behavior at the end, where we're now down to like 20 to 25% disk utilization over time, was due to this patch. And what this patch does, all it does is basically when RocksDB sees a certain number of tombstones during iteration, so if you're iterating over a certain number of keys and it sees a certain number of tombstones, it's all configurable, then it forces a compaction. That's all it is. And that's the difference that we see you know, with that one change. So I, I want to highlight how important it is that like, we think about the behaviors here, right? Like it's all of this other extra unnecessary work that we were doing, iterating over tombstones that caused bad behavior and just changing it so that we're not doing that anymore is what led to this significantly better behavior. So, okay, that's actually the end of my slides here. Um, there's a lot of other situations that we've got where we see stuff like this or other really weird, bizarre behavior. Um, yeah, you know, we're working through a lot of different kinds of issues like this, but more important than like looking at any one tuning parameter or sometimes copying tuning parameters off the mailing list, because I know that happens, um, it's, it's important to think about why these things happen, what the behaviors are, and how we can change those behaviors. So um, I've got a couple of other uh, uh, blog articles that are out there on the Cephal.io blog. Um, you know, please go take a look at them, see if they're, they're useful to you. Um, we're gonna keep trying to do a couple of more of these for Reef, uh, so hopefully that will be useful for people. And uh, that's it, so. Any questions from anyone? Okay. Well, that latest uh, patch you just explained uh, about uh, forcing compaction when you see a certain number of tombstones certainly look very uh, impactful. Is that going to be backported to? Uh, yeah, we should. It's, it's, it's such an easy fix that absolutely we should backport that at least to Quincy, if not Pacific. Um, there, I don't remember when it was implemented, that feature was implemented in RocksDB, so we will have to look at um, what versions we're running, uh, but I think we should be able to at least get it back to Pacific. Cool. So one, uh, in one of your earlier slides, you mentioned a problem with an SSD that had uh, a bright, weird write latencies, and then it disappeared after a firmware upgrade, but then it came back. Um, yes. Here. So like the flash that they use in SSDs is more flimsy than they like to tell you. Uh, if you write the whole disk, uh, then they start doing logging, all this, all this stuff. Uh, and if you do a firmware upgrade, then I, I know that some vendors, they flash this, they, they flush this log. So then ah. for some time, your uh, performance will be back to normal, but then as you start writing more, then it goes back to this weird state. And this especially happens if the, the flash starts dying, because then it has to do more of this GC logging business, and then the performance goes down. Yeah. So that, that, that might, I mean, it's just a hypothesis, technically, but that might explain uh, this problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's really hard to know what to present to people, right? Like, this is maybe the more truthful representation of the state of a, a real cluster, right? Yeah, so when most people show SSD performance, they usually show when a disk is new. But in a real scenario, yeah. it would have been running or writing for so much data that yeah, some of the numbers might not even be realistic, yeah. So there's another blog article that I've been working on. And about halfway through it, we hit this issue. And this article is coming is showing in CBT we have the ability to basically run the exact same FIO benchmark against uh, kernel RBD, uh, uh, libRBD, uh, uh, Fuse with CephFS or kernel CephFS or even iSCSI. Um, 
when I ran through those tests, it made it look like kernel RBD was awful, like it was like 40% slower than libRBD. No, it's just that this came back. So like showing consistent, like can, if I had shown those results, it would show honestly what's happening at the, you know, how these disks are starting to behave. But it shows a really bad view of what, like how kernel RBD looks versus libRBD. So like I want the cluster to behave really consistently because that lets me showcase if there are maybe differences between the clients, but that means I have to always run this like in a, a new configuration. Have you looked at uh, using uh, RAM-based block devices as backings for the OSDs for reproducible We could, benchmarks? yeah, we could. We could absolutely do that. And Blue Store, I don't know, it'd be interesting to see. The last time I did that, it actually didn't look too much different than on NVMe drives, but, um, but it's not a bad idea. The only thing is that, you know, you can't test a lot of data that way, right? Yeah, you need tons of RAM, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I don't have quite that much, but anyway, yeah. Mark, you had a slide with uh, the varying SSD table sizes. Do you think it's worthwhile even to consider some automation that would try to pick the proper um, SSD table size? Which uh, mem slide? Sorry, mem table size, oh, my bad. Oh, mem table size. I don't even remember which slide that was. Was it back or forward, do you think? This one. Oh, okay, this one. Oh, good. Okay. Um, and what was your question again, Adam? Uh, since uh, performance depends on the mem tables, both on both ends, uh, would it make sense to even try some uh, automation that would detect what the optimal mem table size would be for a specific deployment? And it, gets, it gets really complicated. One of the things that I saw was that just changing the mem table size by itself actually led to worse performance. But if you simultaneously change the mem table size and the sizes of like level zero and level one to have everything like set up just right to have like, you know, the pipeline kind of of going from mem table flush to level zero to compacting into level one, uh, if you kind of did everything just right, then it was actually better than, than either of the other scenarios that we had tried previously. So it's, it's complicated. At least that's what it seemed to me. Could you maybe consider having that your next topic for a blog? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it's in the Roxy B tuning thing, but let's maybe, maybe, we try. All right, anything else, guys? I've actually got to go to the you fifth still have floor five to give another you presentation after minutes. this. So, um, uh, well, just last question, may I? Yeah. Uh, is do you think is there a way to detect the moment when your block device starts behave slowing down entire cluster. Just finding out this, the, the, that one outlier that hits your overall performance. I think that's an excellent idea. We should do that. Okay, so it's worthwhile. I think so. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys.